uh, resilience. So Mark, maybe I might just uh, do a slight introduction, small introduction of Mark. Mark is a senior engineer. Uh, he's a senior energy lead at Google and responsible for a very broad remit in Europe, um, responsible for its energy strategy, I understand, Mark. Um, and obviously this uh, topic and subject is very close to, to Mark's heart. So Mark, I might just hand over to you for uh, providing your own uh, introduction and perspective on this subject. Yeah, thanks, John. And uh, yeah, first of all, you know, thank you to RGI for inviting us to moderate this session. Uh, it's a fair topic, but it's a, an unfamiliar um, setting. So uh, I'm really excited to see how this works. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. I'm in a very rural part of France, and so I'm counting on the uh, broadband connection, uh, which I'm getting here. Um, so as John mentioned, I've been with Google for the last five years. Um, sitting physically in Paris. And so my team and I look after Google's energy portfolio in Europe. We figure out where Google builds new data centers and also look after the utilities and figure out the strategy for energy supply. Um, in Europe, we have five data centers, including one in Ireland. Uh, and so in John's uh, area of expertise and remit. And, uh, but we also have this sort of unique position of operating these large data center facilities across five or six European jurisdictions. Um, so we've had the ability to work with different TSOs um, and we have sort of similar goals and similar challenges. As John mentioned on the slide, a data center you know, is absolutely uh, dependent on reliable grid connections. So flexibility has always been sort of a bad word internally at Google, but at the same time, we have this renewed ambition to source only carbon-free energy for all of our facilities by 2030. So flexibility is actually now part of the things we also want to be working on to help our grid partners balance um, load and demand um, or load and supply in their jurisdictions. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about Google's uh, ambitions in this respect in my presentation. John? Yes, yeah, will we do a bit of a round table then and see who else we have um, with us here this afternoon. Um, maybe if everybody turns on their, their videos uh, for a few minutes, I'd say what we, we might have to turn the videos off again, given that we're giving presentations, we've had problems with that before. So maybe we'll do a round. round. I see, see uh, Stefan there. Stefan, do you want to? Okay, uh, I, I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Stefan Krieger. I work with BDEW, which is the largest uh, energy association in Germany. Um, I uh, am uh, looking at the issues of flexibility um, following two lines. The first is to have a broader view on long-term market design. So, so to say for the ne next decade onwards to, to meet uh, climate neutrality, uh, not in the next decade, but uh, in uh, 2050. Um, and the other one is that we are still struggling with um, transposing the, um, uh, the directive of the uh, clean energy package, which is uh, looking at flexibility for DSOs. Um, this is Article 32, and uh, the particular uh, peculiar situation is that we have some um, regulation for part of the problem, but not the whole of it, and we try to figure out how a solution could look like, which is then probably a, a three-tiered approach. Hey, thanks, Stefan. And uh, the next name I see there is, is Alan. Alan, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Alan Cruz from uh, Tenet. So uh, uh, if I'm right, we are also serving uh, one of Google's uh, premises. Uh, but uh, let's say currently my role within uh, Tenet is to look at uh, how to design the future energy system and uh, how to solve indeed the fact that with a lot of uh, integration of renewables, we have a, a big surplus in a couple of hours, and, but we also have a big uh, deficit in the other hours. 
and flexibility is part of the solution. So how to bring things together that in the end, as a TSO, we can make sure that there's a reliable uh, system, energy system uh, running. Uh, but also, uh, let's say, taking into account uh, in an affordable way, in a sustainable way, and uh, meeting, let's say, the uh, requirements of society and acceptance and things like that. So uh, I'm enjoying myself. Okay, um, thank you for that. Christian? Yeah, hello. Uh, Christian, also from Tenet, uh, Tenet uh, the German part of Tenet. Uh, working in the political affairs department uh, for uh, about 10 years now and uh, within the uh, political affairs department uh, I'm dealing a lot with the digitalization data and flexibility topics as they are as, as Alan said very very important uh, for us as a, as a TSO for the design of the future grid and energy system okay Christina, you might as well introduce yourself from RGI. Yes, sure. I'm Christina Simioli. I work for RGI on the advocacy. And um, well, I would like to share with you that in RGI we try the first step uh, um, in trying to navigating the complexity of flexibility because uh, today we have here representative of the transmission system operators, but uh, we have as members also our NGOs and we tried uh, to a uh, first uh, uh, set of discussions uh, to create a common understanding and terminology. I will share with you the link to the web page where you will find more information because uh, flexibility is a central uh, part uh, of reaching a climate neutral uh, um, energy system uh, but at the same time it also needs to be explained and uh, this is uh, our objective so thank you thank you so much for that um erica yeah hello everybody uh, i'm a researcher at the theo Braunschweig in germany uh, and I work on European uh, founded project uh, Bamboo, uh, dealing with uh, energy flexibility in the heavy industries. And I'm also working uh, in my PhD on those topics. So I'm looking forward for some inputs from experts. Thank you. Okay, and Jonathan? Yeah, thank you. Um, so my name is Jonathan Simon. I am a product manager at Enercast in Germany. We are a technology provider for weather-based artificial intelligence. Uh, specifically, we provide a forecast for wind and solar energy to TSOs, but uh, also to um, other players, traders, um, to aggregators um, and, uh, and, and producers. And we um, are interested in learning how we can support the, the transition um, to 100% renewable energy and, uh, and which role uh, forecasts can play in the future energy system. A very important role, Jonathan, I would envisage. Thank you. Okay, uh, Naomi, hi. Hi. Uh, hi Naomi, um, Julia, Senior Policy Advisor at Solar Power Europe. Uh, which is a trade association representing uh, the solar industry, but also we have a couple of uh, members uh, uh, man um, yeah, manufacturing or operating batteries. Okay, very good. And Christopher? Yes, hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christopher. I'm a project director at a consultancy called Altelis, um, and we have worked on flexibility for various uh, clients from uh, GSOs to the European Commission to, to DSOs and uh, the assessment of the need for flexibility on different timescales and what is the optimal mix of technologies to provide these flexibility services from the infra hourly to the seasonal and multi-annual timeframes. Looking forward for, to, to this discussion. Very good. I'm sure you'll have some interesting insights there given your client base. And Nuno. Nuno, you're on mute. Sorry. Okay, do you Hi. find me? No problem. Hi. I hear you now. Okay. Uh, my name is Nuno. I'm working at uh, RAND, the Portuguese TSO. Uh, I work in the studies and innovation department. We developed uh, a lot of models in order to to study the adequacy of the electricity system. 
as you know, the Portuguese system has a lot of wind penetration and in future you will increase a lot of solar. And you need to develop this model in order to not take in consideration the, the adequacy that they have, but also in terms of necessity of ancillary service, the necessity of flexibility in power and the European power system. And I, I attend this, this session in order to, to, to know more or less of flexibility new technology that, that provide this flexibility uh, and how can also you incorporate this information in our models in terms of uh, studies the flexibility of the system. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And Ni Nicola? Hello everybody. I'm sorry you cannot see me but uh, Zoom says that my video has been interrupted by the owner of the webinar. But, uh, however, not 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 to worry. We can hear. Okay, you. thank you. Clear. <laughs> however, I'm Nicola Volpe, and I work in the strategy division of Terna. Uh, my unit uh, is the, the the role of my unit is to define the long-term strategy and positioning of the TSO, and to share it to national and international stakeholder. stakeholders. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Stefan. Yeah, hi, hi guys. My name is uh, Stefan Arweiler. So I'm not sure if you can see my picture, my video. No, no. it doesn't don't, work. Don't but worry about it, Stefan. It's fine. Okay. So there. I'm. Oh, there I, you go. There we are. Okay. Um, so I cannot see me, but I hope it looks okay. Uh, so I work for Siemens Energy in the transmission department, and I would like to gather information uh, how the guys uh, over here see the, the future energy uh, solutions, uh, what in content with the energy transition. I would like to uh, identify the major trends in the, in the market and would like to think about here internally what does this means for our future grid uh, will this be mono or bidirectional um, tran transmission needed uh, will the transmission um, go to distribution or will this uh, uh, will be um, both together what is the role of, of hydrogen how can hydrogen um, is can can be needed uh, parallel to the uh, can be used parallel to the uh, electricity network and um, for me i try to find out what is a trend and what innovations or new solutions uh, will fit into this trends and will be perhaps needed from our side and, okay. and of course and of course i i do a lot of uh, of analysis already about scenarian uh, scenarios and i have an understanding what the world could look like so with this i think i could be also give valuable input okay very good and then we have have one more uh, participant and that's uh, andreas last but not least we can't see you, andreas but hopefully you'll be able to we'll be able to hear you uh yeah i hope so um so uh, i'm uh, yeah, you can hear me, John? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so I'm working with Stadtwerke Leipzig, which is a regional utility company in Germany. And I'm there in the IT department as a product owner. And I'm interested in uh, flexibility in the grid because uh, somewhere down the line, uh, our IT team uh, needs to develop uh, metering solutions and billing solutions in order to make uh, flexibility actually hit the market with end users. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, look, um, I think we, we certainly have a broad spectrum um, and background and expertise that will be able to help us, I think, um, this afternoon address, I suppose, what we're here to do today. And that, that is to I suppose if I, if I would just remind people what we're here to do is to try and make recommendation and observations for the planning discussion. So look, let's make this as interactive as possible. Uh, just my, my daughter coming in, getting her uh, her, her Halloween uh, outfit ready for tomorrow in school. So anyhow, 
we, we adapt in this ever-changing world, right? Um, so look, maybe, maybe I'll just get on and, and what I'd like to do is just give a little bit of a presentation, provide a little bit of context of where, where I'm coming from, um, some of our experience and some of the work that we're doing at a, at a European um, level. So look, I think we all know this. I'm just I'm going to minimize this so everybody can see my screen. Um, this, I suppose, provides us with the, 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 the highest level of, of context um, and the EU, um, as well as is really stepping up its 2030 and 2050 ambition um, by amending the climate law um, in relation to uh, our, our greenhouse gas emissions from at least 40% uh, reduction compared to 1990 to at least 55%. And I think that this is an astonishing ambition. Um, it's uh, a signal of uh, the commitment. It's a signal of where we're going uh, as, an in, uh, as an industry, as a sector, as a society. Um, and um, I suppose uh, what, what, what they are doing also in support of that is obviously a lot of financial commitment in terms of investing in, in infrastructure, research and innovation. Uh, but they're also very focused on um, supporting system integration, uh, hydrogen in terms of developing an, a, a European-wide hydrogen strategy, identifying and supporting the infrastructural needs and developing a, a, a strategy, a long-term strategy for offshore energy, as well as I suppose keeping a very, very close eye on um, national um, energy and climate plans. So keeping the spotlight on us to make sure that at a national level, we're, we're delivering on, on our commitments. So that's just write a little bit of EU context. Um, but this is just, from my perspective, is just to uh, illustrate, I suppose, where we're going with respect to variable uh, renewable technology and maybe uh, to provide a bit of context in terms of Ireland and, and how it, in my mind, is a microcosm of what the future holds for Europe. Um, so this is actually from the, uh, the International Energy Agency. Now, it's a little bit old, but it certainly does give an indication of the, tra the trajectory of where we're going. So if you look today, approximately 30% uh, of our, our res needs are met by renewables. But if we look at that, uh, the, the majority of our renewables are actually met by uh, very stable sources of renewable technology, such as uh, hydro. However, if we look out further, um, the vast majority of our res is going to come from variable sources of, of, of uh, renewables, which adds a significant amount of complexity. So um, in Ireland, we, we have, uh, I suppose, addressed some of the challenges associated with the integration of high levels of renewables, I mean, high levels of wind, so V-Res, um, and I'll talk a little bit later on about that in terms of what it is that we've done and what we hope to achieve. But I do think that it is almost like a case study for uh, Europe um, in terms of what the challenges Europe will face into the future. So to, I, I suppose, emphasize where we're going in terms of V-Res, uh, at a European Commission level, the ambition is to install 250 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2050, which is astonishing. Um, but again, it shows and demonstrates the commitment to um, the renewable agenda. Not only that, uh, are, we, are we, I suppose, introducing a very high percentage of non-synchronous technology such as wind and solar. There are other complexities which are being introduced into the system. Um, and they're all interlinked. So uh, I just tried to use this as an example. Um, one of the primary consequences of obviously high V res is less, less inertia on the system. Um, as well as that, we're looking at shifting to a more decentralized and distributed environment, which gives rise to uh, further congestion on the system. We see significant increase in demand Certainly in Ireland, there's a significant increase, projected significant increase of demand over the next 10 years, which is, uh, I suppose, it adds to our, our challenge. Uh, as well as that, we're looking at the electrification of uh, transport, heat, and cooling uh, on, on, a, on, a, on a global scale. 
Um, we're seeing demand side participation and choice and change in how people use energy and how they are participating in the whole energy space. And they are also seeing um, a change in the patterns of how energy is used. So all of this is adding significant complexity to our energy environment. Um, and I, I suppose to, 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 to highlight that, um, we, we, we see significant challenges associated with the integration of that high level uh, renewables. So um, we're, we're involved in a project which is called the EU CISFLEX project, which is a Horizon 2020 project. And it's very much looking at addressing the challenges of integrating high levels of variable renewables. Um, and we've done a significant amount of studies and analysis through this project on what the system scarcities will look like in Europe by 2030. And we'll see here, I've, I've two illustrations here uh, on, on the left, you see the scarcities which have been identified through uh, a, a, it took 12 to 18 months of study, um, identifying what those scarcities are, particularly in Ireland and Northern Ireland, because we're very much further down the stream in terms of the penetration of renewables, but also the challenges in continental Europe and less so in the Nordic system, which is very, um, I suppose, supported by a highly integrated um, and interconnected system. So um, just to highlight what we have done in Ireland or where, where we have achieved in Ireland, I just want to show this is, uh, we, we use a term called system non-synchronous penetration, which essentially is our ability to um, utilize uh, wind on the system and we, we're, we're capable of operating the system up to 65-70% uh, wind at any given time. Um, and just to illustrate what we, we, we've achieved, uh, in February of this year, 50% of the island's demand was met by wind. Um, so we put in place this uh, program of work in 2010, uh, over the last, I suppose, the last 10 years, the DS3 program, which was about enhancing the system performance the system policies and the system tools to allow us to operate the system up to these high levels. And what we're trying to do now is develop a program to push that out to 95% SNSP, allowing us to meet our overall target of 70% DRES. And the work that we're doing on EU SysFlex is uh, very much um, supporting that. Uh, so. I, what, what I also want to highlight, not just system scarcities, uh, which can be met by a system services market, um, which I think is an extremely important and an ever increasingly important market uh, across Europe, uh, but also to highlight maybe some of the financial implications of uh, the, the penetration of VRES. Um, and maybe uh, to, to, to just to highlight through our, our analysis and work in EU Flex. Um, it has become, I suppose, it's evident that as we transition to this high level um, environment, um, which I suppose with VRES, we have uh, very low and even near zero marginal costs, the market price and therefore the revenues decline for all technologies uh, in an energy only market. Um, so this is also changing the investment cost structure with fixed costs becoming increasingly dominant uh, as the portfolio of VRES increases. Um, and it's apparent that at very high levels of VRES, when the market revenues are low, costs exceed the revenues given rise to significant financial gaps. Um, so one way to resolve that gap and provide a certain level of financial certainty for investment is to uh, developed system services market, so they go hand in hand. Um, so developing a, a, a financial incentives to uh, industry to provide services which are needed on the system in order to operate at higher levels of VRES and to minimize curtailment in effect. I went through this in terms of our achievements here in Ireland. Um, so just to go back to the primary question of what we were asked to do here is who can deliver and under what conditions? And I think uh, this is just thoughts that I threw down on paper uh, in terms of the way I see it. 
um, and really it's very much a very broad spectrum of actors all working together um, in order to meet our, uh, our, our 2030 and 20 beyond 2050 uh, targets. Uh, so you see it touches absolutely everything from the system services market to research and innovation, uh, to enhance interconnection, uh, storage, small scale generation, hydrogen, a change in control center environment, the demand side management side, which I, I suppose is a good lead on here for Mark, but also uh, citizens um, and, and us as users of energy and users of, of, of the grid, uh, the general social acceptance of, of infrastructure we need to bring people with us. So look, that's just to give you um, my perspective on things. Um, and I'd like now maybe to hand over to Mark uh, Mark, do you want me to share your slides, or uh, that's fine? Yeah, if you if you have them, uh, you can present them. Otherwise, I can pull it up. There we go. So just tell me when you want me to change the slides, Mark, and I'll, I'll, I'll work away. Okay. Thanks, John. Let's see. I don't yet see my slides up. I still see the last slide of your presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, otherwise, let me see. Yeah, so it doesn't look like I can share my screen, John. So if you're able to pull up mine, that would be great. Yeah, I have it, I have it up here, Mark. Um, Is it just me or are other people also just seeing the last slide of John's presentation? Yeah, we still see the uh, great one. I can I can share the screen if you want. I have your share. Hold on. How's that now? I'm still seeing that last slide of yours, John. Okay. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll stop sharing and maybe uh, Christina, do you want to share? Can you share? Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. Great. Just a second. Okay. Great. Well, thank you, John, for, for these few words. And I'm going to try to keep my presentation to no more than five or 10 minutes. I'll probably end around quarter four. So that really leaves 30 minutes for a discussion. And um, I don't know if you're all familiar with uh, raising your hand, uh, this sort of tool that you have on Zoom on the, uh, I think it's, I'm not sure where it is, either in the reactions, maybe Christina can advise, but I would say feel free to interrupt me with questions if you have, and then um, I'll plan to stop and that'll leave 30 minutes for a round table discussion uh, with whoever wants to speak first or whoever can raise their hand first. So I will now give you sort of the perspective of a, a large energy user. Uh, for context, Google on a global basis uh, consumed about 10 terawatt hours in 2018, which is our last year uh, where we have public data. And I think for 2019, um, or sorry, for 2019, for 20, uh, 2020, we're going to consume somewhere between 13 and 15 terawatt hours. And so the context for my presentation is there's three parts to it. The first part is I'll uh, go into a little bit of detail about Google's objectives today. Uh, which were announced uh, only a month ago by our CEO, Sundar Pichai, which is that by the end of this decade, Google wants to ensure that whenever you use a Google product, you go on Gmail, you download a YouTube video, or your company and use Google Cloud services, we want to ensure that all of the servers that will be running to provide these digital services and tools will be drawing power from grids where Google can point to a carbon-free resource and saying, that resource is produced power that helped essentially run these servers. Um, and so that is a big challenge for us. Um, and I'll go into a little bit of detail about what that means. And then I'll also give you a couple of ideas about how Google thinks about flexibility specifically with two case studies. So with that, Christina, if you can go to slide two. Are you there, Christina? Yes. Uh, okay, I'm still seeing slide one. 
now it's the corporate renewable energy purchased globally. Is this the correct? That's right. Now I think maybe the issue is, are you on present mode? Uh, because the, the screen still shows the cover slide. So maybe if you exit from like the present mode and you just sort of manually flick through the slides, we might be able to see slide two. Yeah, just a moment. So. Uh, that's much better. Yes. Is this slide two? Yeah. Okay, great. So um, this chart just shows you essentially Google's, um, uh, the total amount of renewable energy purchased by corporates. And so I think one thing to echo Manon's comment from this morning is that in order to reach a world where renewables have fully scaled, we want to, we need to ensure that the demand side also asks for these products. And so, you know, these are examples of companies that have made large investments in procuring renewable energy and Google happens to be among the largest. And I can also echo, I think it was the gentleman from Portugal's comment that our, por our portfolio has historically been quite uh, heavy focused on wind. And we're now trying to rebound with solar and to see what that does for our portfolio. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so essentially what Google announced via its CEO, our CEO last month is that we want to uh, op operate our data centers in a way that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 360 days a year, we are matched with carbon-free resources in every, uh, everywhere we consume power, which largely means looking at our data centers. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So first question you can ask yourself is, well, where is Google today relative to that goal, which is, a, you know, I think a fairly high and ambitious goal for a corporate. And so the first thing we did is we looked at all the facilities which we operate today, and we said, let's look at the average carbon free intensity of these consumption points. And so what we did, and I don't want to go too deep into the methodology, is we looked every hour of the year how much already, how much green electricity was already into the grid. And we're happy to take that power. We know that you know maybe 40% in Ireland in a given day was actually green. And we looked at historical real-time data for, for uh, 2018. And then we layered on top, if we happen to sign a PPA in Ireland as a private off taker with receiving the associated guarantees of origin, then we layered on top of whatever was already green to the grid, additional megawatt hours that were produced in that hour that further made our consumption greener. And then we averaged that out over the year. And you can see that in places like Finland and Oregon, we're doing quite well. Oklahoma is a place where you have a lot of wind. And then there are other data centers like the South east of the US and especially in Asia Pacific where it's much harder. But honestly, the real challenge for us is getting all of these centers um, to 100%. And you know, going from 60 to 70 is gonna be easier than going to sev from 70 to 80. But currently on a global basis, we're at 61%. Um, let's go to the next slide. And so I think this is the problem that as energy experts, I think you're all familiar with. I won't spend too much time. Through our PPAs, we end up having a lot of excess renewable energy in many hours of the day, or typically if this is a wind, uh, you can see this is a wind production pattern. But the challenge is that our consumption is very much baseload and will stay baseload, perhaps with a couple exceptions, and we'll come back to that. And so the challenge that we as, a, as an off-taker are facing as to how to ensure uh, the stability of our systems and, and have appropriate backup in case of failures while tailoring our renewable energy purchases so it's a better match against a quasi baseload like load. Let's move to the next slide, please. And so again, I think it's really important for users, but also other corporates to think carefully about what it means to be in a carbon free world and what is how do we measure the goal that we're all seeking. And this is a different way to measure these clocks that I was presenting a couple of slides earlier. On this slide, we have on the horizontal axis every day of the year, and on the vertical axis, the 24 hours day and night. And so what you can see is that this was the status quo uh, we faced in Chile uh, with quite a bit of uh, sort of coal or fossil related uh, sources of power in the grid. And if you go to the next slide, you can see visually the impact that our first 80 megawatt solar PPA had, which is very much greening uh, the, the, the sun hours. 
And then what we're trying to do statistically and then in our procurement efforts is to see what would be the impact of adding wind as well as potentially energy storage to see what that facility would look like in terms of its ability to reach 100% carbon free. And so we can see that with solar alone, we already reached 60% average carbon free energy during the year. And if you go to the next slide, you can see the impacts that adding additional solar plus some wind would bring us north of 90% carbon free. Okay, let's move to the next slide, please. Um, and this is the long-term objective, bring that whole bar green. I think that's pretty clear to this group. Um, so I wanna spend a couple of minutes just telling you about that in terms of flexibility, can we as a baseload non, uh, well, it's the reverse from non-dispatchable, we must run. Can we, as a, as a consumer, can we change that? And there's two things that Google is currently working on. Uh, so I'll come back to that in a second. We're really focusing on three areas to improve our carbon transactions. Um, you know, John mentioned this sort of super ambitious target for offshore wind. And as, a, as an energy buyer, I'm really looking at offshore wind with great interest. I can see governments wanting to no longer subsidize uh, that technology. We've also noticed that the costs are down. And so for me as a buyer of electricity, I'm very keen to help scale offshore wind, whether that's in Germany, the Netherlands, off the coast of Ireland, uh, or the UK. As a large energy user, I think there's going, I expect to see a huge amount of procurement effort to help get these new offshore wind parks built in a way which is cost effective for us as a consumer and for the industry as a whole. Um, Let's move to the, to the next slide. This is my final slide and I have a couple more things to say. In terms of how we consume power, I wanted to emphasize the fact that I've started a very interesting project in to change when Google's data centers are run. What we've been able to do is to partner with a Danish um, startup called Tomorrow that produces something called electricitymaps.org which gives you a real-time vision into the carbon contents of uh, demand as well as generation in most European grids. And we are now trying to take in that signal as an input to when to run jobs. And at Google, there's, if we think very simply, there's two types of jobs. There's some jobs which are very latency sensitive and cannot be moved around. This is a Google query. The answer needs to be there right away. And there's also cloud customers like banks and financial services and other customers that need to ensure that their jobs are run right away. The other type of job you can think about is a, is a big YouTube video, which you'll upload and several hours later, that video will be processed. And so that processing is less latency sensitive. And so we're trying to tailor the signal to change which, which jobs are run in two ways. Perhaps our data center in Ireland is not very green right now, because there's just not a whole lot of wind as we speak. But we know that for the next day at the same time, Ireland should have a big gust of wind and lots of carbon-free resources. We can actually physically delay the running of that job by a few hours to capture the lower CO2 contents of the Irish grid. Or we can say that there's maybe a job in Singapore, which we can actually easily run in our, let's say, Danish data center, which happens today to have plenty of carbon-free resources and you know, also perhaps cheaper electricity as well. So there's a time shifting as well as a geographical shifting, which we're exploring. And if you're interested in this topic, I would invite you to look at a paper we published in April of 2020 called Greener Google, where we describe a little bit technically how this might work. The final idea I wanna leave you with um, is the idea that all of our data centers are backed up one for one, typically with diesel gensets. And these diesel generators are not carbon free at all. And so one thing we'd like to do is to find ways to economically remove the need for some of the diesel gensets. And one idea is to deploy uh, on-site batteries uh, that would provide backup in addition to the diesel gensets. They wouldn't totally replace them, but they would allow us to cut down the amount of diesel gensets on site. And they would also, if we size them appropriately, allow us to provide grid services to TSOs and DSOs in the markets we operate. So that's something we're very actively looking at. We're very excited because we can see both the 
uh, carbon-free impact of that addition, mm -hmm. as well as the added role that data centers can play uh, in energy markets with one caveat. We will not deploy these technologies if we don't see a path to scalability, which essentially means it has to be TCO positive. And we would not do that if we felt that we were paying four or five X the cost of a diesel backup generator, and there was no way for the industry as a whole to do the same. So we're happy to be pioneers, but the caveat is our management team requires us to demonstrate a path to financial viability for these innovations. And the good news is that as we've seen in onshore wind in solar and now in offshore wind, we are seeing significant year on year declines in battery costs. And we'd like to play a role into accelerating that downward trend. Very good, Mark, very, in, very interesting um, presentation. And I, I suppose a different perspective um, and I, I suppose what the, the couple of things that come to my mind is, you know, the relevance of some of uh, the work that you're doing on the, on the broader scale. Um, I mean, just looking at your the project, I know you, you're talking about the, tomorrow. Is that the the Danish company that you're working with? Um, yeah, correct. It almost feels to me like a demand side management and congestion management uh, algorithm. Uh, and, and, and system solution at uh, a data center level, which in my mind could potentially be, you know, scaled up to, to managing congestion and demand uh, at a more global and system level, um, uh, including the forecasting piece. So it's a very, very interesting um, development. One, one question, and, and before maybe we get into the, the discussion, um, and I understand that it's all about the economics of it and the viability of the path of financial um, viability. Um, are, are, have Google an interest or are Google looking at the hydrogen question or hydrogen technology? Are we gone? Have we lost Mark or lost me? I, I think I heard your question, John. Did you? Sorry for Google's involvement in hydrogen? Is that the question? Yeah, as a technology, I mean, we talk about base load and obviously hydrogen, hydrogen in many ways could be an answer to a lot of our, our, our uh, problems. Um, I'm just interested to know if, if Google are uh, involved in any kind of research with respect to hydrogen. Very, very much so, I'll be brief. Uh, we are looking at use of hydrogen in two ways. One is a backup. Uh, power that would be cleaner than diesel and a second as a direct source of power in the same way that you know we would procure uh, via you know a gas plant um, you know just base load actual supply in lieu of grid power so we are exploring that in both ways and we know that the technology is not at cost parity but uh, if there's a role for us to play we'd like to play that so we are in sort of early stage discussions with some consortiums and some geographies. Um, I know the Netherlands, I think, is a front runner in that reflection, as well as Germany. So we are uh, looking at that as we speak. Very interesting. Okay, um, th there's, before we get in, because I, I, I suppose there's, there's probably just a framework of what we want to get out of this afternoon and to bring back to the, the panel session. Um, but just more generally speaking, has anybody any questions for myself or Mark, um, just based on what we've, we've shared, our perspectives, or would you like to share your own perspective on what we've had to say? Hey, maybe one question. Uh, I tried to raise my hand, but it doesn't I work see your, I see your blue <laughs> hand there now, Alan. I see the blue <laughs> hand. Go ahead. Yeah. No, uh, Mark, thank, thanks for, for the presentation. It gave uh, quite a uh, nice insight how you're looking at let's say the geographic ch change of, uh, of using, let's say the renewables, which uh, at least gave me a new perspective how you can, let's say, move around renewables without needing the grid by just uh, moving the jobs around. So that's, that's a nice thing uh, to, to look at. But uh, wh what I was wondering is how much flexibility do you see in your load as such? Uh, your graphic shows kind of 20%. But is that indeed representable or uh, is it more or less just to get a kind of order of magnitude what, what you're able to do? Yeah, it's a really good question. And um, we're still working on the quantification. You know, I think a lot of it depends on 
our product mix, which is changing. You know, five years ago, it was all about Gmail and Maps and YouTube, internal sort of Google to end users. We're increasingly serving companies. And so part of the answer will depend on the makeup of the jobs that companies give to Google, that companies want to put on the cloud. And so it's through discussion with our clients that we're gonna figure out the answer. Okay, but you're also thinking about kind of uh, incentivizing the customers to use, let's say, uh, planable jobs. Is that also a route that you're looking into? I think um, that's a great question. I think that there's two parts of the answer. One is customers, Google Cloud prospective customers, are asking us very detailed questions about the carbon contents of a workload on a Google Cloud uh, data center. And so as a, as a renewable energy person, I'm now working to educate our cloud sales teams about what it means to be 100% renewable, what it means to be 100% carbon free. And so it's an education process. And also, you know, we're trying to essentially meet our clients requirements and help them understand their own. Um, so I would say that it will be also a function of what our customers want. Uh, in terms of they might be willing to have a job process later if Google can guarantee a cleaner content. I think, you know, not just Google and other tech companies, I think there's a broader recognition that as a planet, we have to be sustainable and that end customers, whether you're a car manufacturer or, um, you know, you're producing steel, that your customer or your customer's customer is going to ask about the sustainability contents of your products. And so I think that what we're trying to do is to give our customers the ability to have the cleanest possible digital service. And then it'll be sort of up to them to decide, you know, what they'd like to do. Okay, thanks. Okay, very good. Um, Thanks for that. You can probably hear my, uh, my, my, my seven-year-old in the background shouting there. Uh, Jonathan, the, the joys of working from home. Huh? Jonathan, you, you have a question. Yes, and uh, maybe a follow-up to the previous question. So um, I think that um, uh, when, when, when that was a, was a great um, uh, concept, and that's a great concept of, of shifting, ge geographically shifting the computing load. Um, but I... I, I um, was thinking, would you then need to install additional computing capacity in, in data centers explicitly for providing the flexibility? And is this also part of the concept already? Or um, I mean, this is also a huge additional cost, I imagine. So um, uh, I would be interested in how far you, uh, you would see this going. Sorry, uh, it's another great question. I think that our long-term you know, plans to scale do already take into account to some degree how clean are the grids. And so I think that already you've noticed that our data centers in Europe are located in places where by and large we've been able to access large amounts of carbon-free power. We have had to put some data centers in Asia because there is demand there which until today, we haven't been able to move around, although we'd like to. And also through additional undersea cables, we're able to, able to better connect data centers. So I think we're gonna be less dependent, strictly speaking, on one specific data center to run the clean jobs. But I, I think that generally, uh, yes, we will need to grow data center campuses. And one of the factors will be the extent to which that grid is clean. And so that's why, again, I mentioned offshore wind, because we are starting to be limited somewhat by how much clean energy we can produce. We are running out a little bit of onshore wind. And even though solar is very attractive because of the more consistent generation profile, uh, because we're in fairly northern latitudes, we're not going to cover as much of our consumption just by procuring local solar. So that's why I'm also looking increasingly at offshore wind as a very large source of clean power that will help us justify expanding those campuses that are connected to offshore wind farms. Thanks for that, John. I see uh, Naomi has her hand raised also. Naomi, you have a question? Yes, uh, two questions, but more to you, actually. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, but thanks a lot for the presentation, uh, Mark. I, you're, I you're, off that, the, uh, you're off the hook, Mark. Yes. <laughs> No, but I found it uh, very interesting. Uh, well, I, as you know, uh, Solar Power Europe is uh, one of the founding um, uh, members of Resource, so, so we know you quite well, but very interesting. Uh, no, two questions to you, John. Um, so the first uh, thing on the project, just to know what is the timeline and uh, when you expect first results. And then more, I mean, a couple of uh, participants today said that uh, there was a need for adaptation, so understand how to make the system work uh, with more uh, solar, uh, develop maybe new flexibility products, etc. Um, how do you do that uh, at national level? And uh, I, I guess in Ireland you have uh, an experience already of how to do that. And is, would there be a value to to do something like that at European level and start to have a, I don't know. Um, a discussion at least at, at European level on the on the, the yeah the new needs of of the grid, for example. Okay, so may, maybe I'll just deal with the first question, and then maybe we can we can go back on on the second one just to get a, get a clear understanding of what what um, exactly you're you're looking for. So, um, I, I think if you're referring to so we have to, there's, there's two aspects to the. The, the system integration, renewable system integration um, work that we've been doing over the last 10 years and what we've been involved in. So one element of that is, is called the DS3 program. Um, I'll send on, I see Mark sent on a couple of links as well. So I'll send, I'll send on a link uh, to our website on, on relevant information. Um, but what that really is about is about the, the system changes that have had to occur um, both at a, an IT level and at a, a controller level. The introduction of new tools in the control room and um, forecasting um, and that kind of thing and then there's the market uh, well sorry around that then there's all policies and procedures but also the market dimensions um, that, that, that run alongside that so part of the market dimensions have been the, uh, the, the single energy market in Ireland and the integrated single energy market then uh, with, with the European broader market but also it's the introduction of the system services market. And the system services market is really a, a broader uh, ancillary services market. So um, the importance of this system services market has grown significantly in Ireland. So if we look back at the ancillary services market in 2015, and I know Ireland is a smaller market, but it does provide a little bit of a perspective. The, the, the market was worth approximately 50 million euro in uh, 2015. 2016 with maybe three or four ancillary services and in order to uh, to enhance our ability to utilize renewables at any given time we needed to support them that, that market further and introduce the system services market which um, uh, it initially had 12 um, services um, both frequency and voltage services of uh, a variety of of um, response time, um, and that market is now worth over a hundred million euros. So within the space of two or three years, the value of that market in Ireland has doubled. And through the work that we've done now in EU Sysflex, which is the Horizon 2020 project that I referred to, we've now identified the scarcities out to 2030, um, mainly or, or mo most uh, relevant to Ireland and Northern Ireland. And we estimate that the value of that system services market um, is going to grow substantially more. Um, the trajectory is out to eight to 900 million euro by 2030. Uh, so it's going to be a very, very sizable market. And I suppose that, that that's also the piece I was talking about, the, that the financial gap that uh, gives rise um, as I said, which is which is very much related to the fact that you have a much higher penetration of, of renewable, where the, uh, the the primary costs are, are capital costs rather than operating costs. So look, I'll send on some links on the EU Sysflex project also. Uh, but in terms of timeline, in terms of results, we're already producing results. We're three years into that project now. Um, if you go onto our website, all of the reports are all all publicly available, although most of them are yeah. um, the, the completion of the project is 2021. So we're hoping to complete by November 2021. Um, 
Yeah, so that's it. So your, your second question. I didn't quite get your, your question you were asking. No, um, I guess it's more a, a general question. I don't know what you want to discuss in this, uh, this workshop, but um, on our side, what we hear from uh, our members and uh, potential flexibility providers is that there is a, uh, they want to understand what are the needs um, of, uh, of system operators and, and they want to have a discussion. So I'm wondering from your experience, uh, how should we, how do you see things advanced in the next years? Do you have good uh, practices from Ireland, from the DS3 uh, process? Yeah, I, I'll tell you, I'd, I'd be happy enough to take that, uh, take that offline and if we want to try and maybe set something up with, you, with your members to discuss further, um, we could potentially uh, set up a workshop um, to try and, and, and help. Um, but I, I suppose it's everything that I've been alluding to here um, and, and then to, to I, I suppose to to uh, to demonstrate the or through demonstration projects, we're also testing uh, flexible capability of technology um, through eight or nine different demonstration projects. So it's it's mainly demonstrating flexibility from the distribution side to the transmission system. Um, so there's there's a lot of interesting things happening there. Okay, um, I'm just I'm just conscious of maybe trying to put a bit of shape as well. I don't know what. How much time do we have left, uh, Christina? Yeah, John, we have um, we have eight minutes left. Left. Wow. Okay. So may, maybe we we will try and maybe do a roundtable on some of the questions, some some key questions, and just get a quick perspective on 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 it. Um. So maybe maybe to ask the the question of the uh, of our of our uh, table here is to. Um, well, what, what, are, what do you see as being the key flexibility needs of the, the future renewable energy system? I, mean, I think myself and Mark have outlined ours, but has anybody got a perspective on that? And also, what, what regulatory changes or market changes might need to happen to uh, enhance that or facilitate it? If I can pitch in on that one, uh, John, uh, because Please what you're... What you have shown, I think uh, Airgrid and Ireland has done already quite a big step forward on indeed the ancillary market, because that might be indeed uh, the more tricky part there. And I think uh, Mark has shown how Google is picking that up uh, in a broader sense than uh, I thought first. But well, one of the things that I uh, still am uh, struggling with and which uh, we're, uh, are we indeed tapping into, let's say, the complete society? Because as you have mentioned, you already have 12 products with different uh, response time, different things. And isn't it too complicated at this moment? Uh, Google has a, a specific person just to educate the rest of uh, the people. So how do we bring, let's say, flexibility to a level that uh, we can tap into much more pro uh, processes or products either being households or let's say small businesses who doesn't have let's say the time the money the expertise to really understand what is needed from let's say a technical perspective i think that's a part we also mentioned this morning uh, uh, by your own uh, ceo we, we are in uh, let's say also educational business and i think that's that's where we have to look at ourselves that we need to look in, into that Yeah, um, and I, I think certainly, I mean, you picked up on, on, on our own CEO and he's very much focused on, you know, the, the, the whole societal question and uh, bringing citizens with, with us on that journey. I, I, I think some of it um, almost, in my, in my mind, is, is a partnership almost in the sense with uh, citizens in that it's trying to explain our role and trying to explain the benefits of our role in terms of, uh, the environment side and the the, 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 the cost efficiency side, but also to see or, or to demonstrate possibly what's in it for communities in terms of community uh, renewable projects and also developing a, a renewable demand side uh, market where, where citizens actually benefit directly from uh, the provision of, of services from their, their own home. But I think that that needs to be packaged up 
uh, as a product rather than any technical conversation. Uh, people need to be able to see the value in it, both financially and environmentally. And I think if it's packaged up correctly um, and, uh, and sold eloquently enough, um, I, I, I think we could be on to something. And, and there should be a fun factor in it, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I like I the, the, the fun factor Mark introduces in his slides with all his flashing lights on you and managing demand. It's all about cat videos, people. <laughs> so anybody else have a perspective on that? Well, this is Christina, and uh, I, I shared in the in the chat a link to our web uh, page where we um, published our first of fourth, as I said before, in uh, trying to um, explain flexibility. We tried to, with our users and NGOs to find a common understanding. I have to say, this is still very complex. Um, and at the same time, you also will see a video on uh, electrification and flexibility. So that in RGI, we are doing this step towards uh, making uh, these uh, very complex and technical topics accessible to the larger audience. So please have a look. And uh, as RGI, we are happy to keep working on this. I think one of the other big problems with, 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 uh, with electricity and energy is its intangible nature. Um, you know, everybody turns on their lights and their kettle, but they don't, they don't really think too much about it after that. Uh, they'll only really, really question when it isn't there. Um, so it's a challenge for us all, I think. Yeah, John, I would agree. This is not a Google perspective, but I find that, you know, it's, there's such inelasticity in the demand that I think, you know, we can cut short a lot of, I find, misinformation and sort of futile debates about renewable people want to disconnect hospitals. And, you know, I think, I think we should really all benefit if we can introduce more flexibility and more, you know, visibility into the pricing. And, you know, I guess to make a little plug, I guess, you know, things like Nest that Google is now selling, if you can actually see the cost and maybe the carbon content of what you're drawing right now, maybe you're going to go ahead and turn off that, you know, that light or just turn down that air conditioning. And to me, it's, it's unbelievable that in the 21st century, we don't have it in every home. Like I think the cost to make that information available is, is small, certainly at scale. And then I think, you know, who knows how people will act on it. But I think the first thing would be to make that information available, whether you're a large consumer. And I think, you know, that's what Google considers itself. And we want to help serve our large customers who are cloud customers. But also, I think we should be thinking about everybody in their homes and individual decisions. And I, I sort of feel like there's hope in humanity. I think if we make that information available, I don't think everybody will reduce their consumption, but I feel like a large majority of people will do the right thing. Making that information available. Mark, I see we're, um, Christina, are we, are we, are we uh, we're, we're getting called back now. We're, yes. It's at three fifteen. Um, look, it's been very interesting. I think um, we probably didn't get to all of the questions that we wanted to ask. We could probably talk here for the next the next two hours. I think on, on this subject. Um, so, Christina, maybe you'll guide us as to what what, what everybody needs to to do yeah. next. In one minute, uh, we will be kicked out from the breakout rooms and we will uh, be uh, transported into the virtual plenary session again. So you don't need to do anything. This session will end and uh, you will be directed to the new session. Great technology. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, thanks, Zoom. <laughs> okay, does anybody want to add anything um, before we, we go? Th thanks so much to everybody for um, coming along to this and, and uh, contributing to the discussion. I, I've stuck up a couple of links there as well to, to, 